My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on everything else. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, also known as the creator of the term FOMO, or fear of missing out, and I'm coming at you from AW360 Studios in the heart of New York City, which is the global capital of FOMO. Entrepreneurship FOMO is real. More than half of college students want to start a business when they graduate. But finding the courage and the idea to launch a business is not an easy thing to do. I wrote an entire book on the topic. It's called The 10% Entrepreneur. And in the book, I show you how to invest at least 10% of your time and if possible, 10% of your money to start a business on the side. But how does this work in the real world? Uh, When you have limited time, you have limited money, and you must manage scarce resources in general. There are some amazing stories of people who are building businesses part-time all over the world, and today I have a guest whose story really captured my attention. I read about him and his company in the press, and I knew I just had to have him on the show. Today I have Sisu Lee, who is the founder and CEO of 82 Labs, a fast-growing consumer goods company behind the brand Morning Recovery. Prior to founding 82 Labs, uh, Sison worked as a staff member at Tesla, where he built out the growth product team responsible for accelerating the adoption of Tesla vehicles globally. He was also a product manager at Uber, and he started his career at Facebook. Sison holds a systems design engineering degree from the University of Waterloo out in Canada, which if you haven't heard of it, is the ultimate place for smart Canadians to go to school. And he actually is joining us today from Toronto, Canada. So welcome, Sison. Uh, thank you for coming to join me on FOMO Sapiens. Yeah, thank you for having me here. Very excited. So your story really captured my attention. Um, I'm really interested in what you're doing, and I'm excited to have you here. It's, it's like sort of like having a celebrity on the show, uh, given the amount of press you've had. But before we get going and you tell us about your incredible journey, I want to know from you the most important thing. What is giving you FOMO right now? It's probably more on the social side. Obviously, becoming an entrepreneur for the first time, 24-7 of my life is devoted into 82 Labs and making this business successful. Um, so there's always exciting events uh, with friends and family uh, that I feel like I'm missing out. I think that's a big component of it. Yeah, you know, I think I hear this a lot from entrepreneurs. So your your answer, and I, every time I ask an entrepreneur what gives them FOMO, nobody, they, they may say, listen, I'm so busy. There's things I wish I could be doing in my business. But a lot of times what they say is, listen, I'm heads down, I'm fully focused on my business right now, and as a result, I don't have the time to spend with my friends or my family uh, that I did in the past. So I completely understand your FOMO. Now, I'll tell you what doesn't give me FOMO, and that's the f- when I found out that the average person in South Korea consumes 14 shots of liquor, I had sort of this anti-FOMO, like I really didn't want to miss out, I- I'd be happy to miss out on that, but at the same time, I love a good party, I think that you know that sounds like people are having a pretty good time. So you went to South uh, South Korea, which is where you're, the place where you were born. You went and visited uh, a couple of years ago, and you st- actually it kind of changed your life. What what happened in South Korea besides apparently a lot of shots that um, that transformed who you are as a person today? Oh, sure. Um, you know, my trip to Korea sort of roots back to how this whole. Uh, business and idea actually came from. But it, it, it wasn't so pivotal in a sense that, you know, I took what I've learned in Korea and that changed my life immediately, but it definitely planted a seed at the back of my head that a couple of years later, you know, it's something that I thought about and actually implemented, which was there's a sort of an absurd and very unique drinking culture there. Um, people essentially drink a lot and they drink very often. And it's not just associated with social, um, a lot of the drinking actually happened professionally. So you would go there and any kind of new business person you meet before you sign any deals or negotiate or do any kind of uh, business deals, you actually meet up 
and you get wasted. And so that's very common. And so I never, I grew up in Korea, but I never lived there as an adult. And so for me to go back a couple of years ago, my goal was to really experience what the locals experienced. Um, and so I got a good sense of that nightlife and also how business is done and how everything was associated with drinking. Um, and definitely from that experience, um, I was hung over too many times. And it also turned out that thankfully, there was already a big innovation around cures around this that the locals uh, would always recommend me. And so that's when this whole idea of preventing, recovering from hangover, liver detox um, was really planted at the back of my head. And what are they drinking? Is this shoju? Is this, like, I'm, I really want to understand when you, if, because I really want to go to Korea um, and, and um, but I don't necessarily want to, uh, you know, wake up every morning with a huge ha- hangover. What, what are people drinking? Oh, it's definitely soju. Uh, okay. Hands down. Okay, but this, so you have this, this insight, you come back to the States, and then you embarked on this really uh, kind of epic journey where you did all kinds of hacks. I mean, you, you, had, you were working full time, and on the side you're doing things like you're hiring people on Fiverr to get you started, you're actually creating a, a prototype, you're drinking so much to test it that you ended up in the hospital uh, with uh, sort of like a palpitating heart. Like, what, what were the steps you took when you got back from that trip that took you from, okay, this is a cool idea, this is interesting, like there is a need for this, um, to actually sort of having a product out there that worked? Yeah, and even that distinction of trans, sort of moving on from curiosity to working on a side project and eventually working on this as a full-time business is very blurry. Um, and so the early why days because was, of all the showed you or just because, <laughs> because? No, I mean, that too that too but it was sort of a it, was a it was a spectrum you know I never I never woke up one day and said I'm gonna work on this as a project I'm gonna make money I'm gonna build a company it was very sequential and so the early day was I was frustrated as a consumer that similar products didn't exist in the states and I just wanted them and so I just brought a bunch of these brands from Korea over to uh, US to my home. And you know, I, I remember this was back in early 2017 and I was just using it for my own, own usage. Um, but I had way too many of these products. And so I started giving them out to friends and family. Uh, and they were sort of the perfect gift. If you think about it, they were sort of packaged in this small glass bottles. It's not labeled in English. And I would go around explaining what it is. And it's almost like a magic elixir. So it was sort of a fun conversation. There was nothing more to it. But naturally, I would get feedback from friends and family that tried it, which was sort of universally, people loved it, had great feedback, and they were asking the same questions that I had, which was, how does it work? Um, You know, and no one in Korea could also explain to me at a very scientific level. It was sort of like energy drink in a sense that it was sort of universally accepted. It was everywhere. Very few people questioned it. And so... You know, I got very curious. My friends in America were asking me, well, how does it actually work? Sure, I feel better, but why? And I wanted to know that question too. And so I think that's when I was, I sort of got very curious and I wanted to dig into it. And the first step was very simple. I just started Googling uh, the core ingredients. And so it turns out that a lot of these Korean uh, drinks are rooted off of this herb called Hovania dulcis, which is also known as the Japanese raisin tree, uh, which mm. also grows in Korea and other parts of Eastern China. And so I started searching into that, and it turns out there's a flavonoid within this herb that you can extract called DHM, and then that's how I stumbled across animal studies uh, that was conducted by doctors at UCLA that sort of showed and proved that uh, it actually had an effect on sort of detoxing the liver and and thus sort of helping you eliminate the pains of uh, alcohol, you know, the next day. And so that was the early days. Then out of curiosity, I reached out to those doctors Next thing you know, um, I'm working with those doctors. They're actually our co-founder, sits on our scientific advisory board. And, you know, fast forward 12 months, you know, we're chatting here um, with with us running a team full of 20 people. So uh, it was definitely crazy. And there's definitely lots of pieces there, but that's how it got started. And did you find as you were launching this, I mean, you had this great idea. Um, you put together, it's quite astounding what you've done, especially uh, given the fact that you were working on a part time. You, uh, as we discussed before, you were a 10% entrepreneur, as I like to call it. You were doing this on the side. How did you manage to do so much? I mean, you 
developed a product that you just said that you put together an advisory board. Um, I was reading uh, some of your, your writing that you went from sort of the first phase of the business, you generate a million dollars in three months. How did you manage to do all these things while, I mean, it's not like you're a slouch. You, you worked at Uber, Facebook, and Tesla. Like I, you're clearly a bright guy, but those are all pretty demanding places to work. How did you manage to do these things working in such a demanding job? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, when we look at a product or service, um, I think the most important thing is how big how big of a demand there is. And so for us, in the very early days, that's all I wanted to evaluate, how many people like this. And so when, it, when the curiosity became full-time, sort of a part-time research to the point where I wonder how, would, actually, would people actually buy this in the States? I just created a website to see how many people would sign up. Um, for this potential launch of a product. Um, and it was a lot more than I anticipated. And then, you know, we then launched on Product Hunt for sample giveaways, which then we got over 20,000 subscribers. And so there are things that I did that actually didn't take a lot of time, but I wanted to evaluate if there was actual demand. And, you know, these things, like you said, with 10% of your time, um, you can evaluate it. It's, it's really just talking to your customers, asking them what they think. And in this case, um, we sort of found this problem, which was hangovers. And by all measurement, um, sort of economic data, um, it was a big problem. And if you consider that two thirds of the U.S. beverage market by sales is alcohol, people consume a lot of alcohol. The self-reported sort of productivity loss from being over the next day is something like 150, 200 billion. And so, so you know, and then you sort of ask people, and you understand you also have that pain point. Would you pay a couple of dollars to solve it? And you know, overwhelmingly, the answer was yes. And so. That's, I think that's how we sort of accelerated, which was before we even built a product, 100% sort of our focus there, because there's a lot that goes into product development, especially for something like uh, drink, because it's not just the formulation, there's product safety, compliance, branding, labeling, packaging, pricing, distribution, you know, flavor, you name it. But in the early days, we just didn't think about any of it. And we just thought, is there a demand? Let's push it as far as we can. Let's find out what really matters to people. And then let's take those incremental steps. And so the first thing that we found out that matters to people was, no surprise, it was efficacy, which was people didn't really care about the flavor, the format, or pricing. They just wanted to know, does it really work? And so the first thing that we did with Dr. Liang, who is one of the doctors that I mentioned, that you know, we sort of saw on Google, um, was to build a sample and give to them. And our early sample was a white powder. Right, there was no, uh, it wasn't packaged nicely. <laughs> it looks like anthrax. <laughs> you can't yeah, mail it. It, was, it, was just, it. it looked like some kind of drugs. Um, and so I can't give to strangers, but I can give to friends and family. I can take it myself. And so, you know, these things, they don't take that much time. We're not, we're not building a real product. We're essentially taking an MVP of it, which is the, the core ingredient. And then we want to get their feedback. Did it work? Did you like it? Would you buy it again? Uh, or not again, would you buy it if this was priced and packaged nicely? And so that's how we started to grow. And, and you know, for us to say we made a million in three months, that doesn't account for these early side project days. It's once the side project days grew into um, the point where we, we, had, we handed out hundreds of samples, um, many of them in the powder format. Later, we diluted it in water because a lot of the strangers found it too skeptical. And then we added some flavoring. And then when that feedback was great, we got the product on sort of success. We then launched it on Indiegogo, and that was the first time that we got our initial sales. And then the three subsequent months later, we made a million dollars. Wow, that's incredible. Let me ask you a question. So you talked about your time. You know, you're working, you're doing on this on the side. You're doing these very low risk tests, right? You're putting it on, um, you know, in a, in a basic website to see how much you know it would cost to, or sorry, how much interest there is. You're doing, uh, you know, taking new technologies in order to validate your idea. How much money did it cost to validate that this was a good idea? Yeah, I think even validating the point was it was not binary. There is sort of multiple sequential steps. Yeah. Um, so the real validation was the first sales that we had, which was Indiegogo. Um, and so the total amount that we spent up to that point was probably around $20,000. And most of them went into legal fees, which was, you know, we had the doctor, we formulated, but we don't know anything about FDA and regulation. And so we, we sort of didn't take the bet on learning it ourselves. We hire consultants legal consultants. So that's where most of the money went. In terms of the actual product development, building a website, raising awareness, um, it was very, uh, it, it wasn't a lot. 
And so the predicting demand before that was actually getting samples out. And samples to us costed no money because our doctor at USC was already making it by hand. Um, the cost wow. of hosting website, building website, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a couple of tens of dollars. And then the other uh, amount that we spent was, you mentioned Fiverr. You know, when we wanted to turn our powder into a drink form and actually dilute it, we needed to work with a co-packer that was capable of doing it. But we didn't know any co-packers because that's not the field that I'm in. And so essentially, uh, we needed to go find factories that was capable of doing it. And we outsourced that task on Fiverr. We put up $10 task and asked people to find us liquid dietary supplement manufacturers around the world that wanted to come and make 1,000 samples of our bottle. Uh, and we would give them a couple of, you know, we would negotiate on pricing. And so that aspect was very small. Most of it was legal. But in total, I think we spent about $20,000. That's incredible. So that is the part of entrepreneurship in 2018 or 2016 when you were doing this or that really blows my mind. The idea uh, is always hard. You know, it's you, 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 you need to work hard to come up with the idea and figure out something that makes sense for you. You've done a nice job picking something that um, bringing something from somewhere else and making it relevant to a new market, which is a really nice way to start a business. But what I love about this, and I think it's really important for anybody who wants to start a business to pay attention to, is that, yes, it did take some time, but the financial part uh, was not a huge barrier. Yes, you, you had to invest $20,000, but a lot of that was into the legal part of it. The actual product development, figuring out how to make a product and get people to try it and see if it worked in the real world was insignificant. Building the website, testing whether or not people were looking for this, not a lot of money. Going to Product Hunt, that's free. Doing the Indigo Ogo campaign is free, although you would, of course, want to spend money on production. But it was not a financial barrier uh, that you had to face. It was more a barrier of making sure that you found a product that made sense and then getting it to hands of people and starting that process of building, I guess, a fan base that would want to buy your product. And that, to me, is, is amazing because, I mean, the idea that you would go to Fiverr and get somebody for $10 to find co-packers, like, these things didn't happen five years ago, even five years ago. And so this is such a modern story of entrepreneurship. It just, it's, it's like... To me, this is, you know, the, there are people like you, Susan, all over the world, and, and many have not attained your level of success, but you are leading this tribe of people who are doing things in such a sustainable way. It's just, it's, it's really, it, it's, it's very inspiring to those of us who, you know, aspire to build, to build a business someday. Um, yeah, and I think it's, uh, you know, that's, go ahead. The, that's a great uh, infrastructure that we have, right? I, I don't think five years ago, without, without Fiverr, without Prodicon, um, we could have done this. And the the, the amazing thing that I'm, I'm seeing is that I come from the software world where starting a decade ago, building internet businesses became really easy because you could be could be a nomad. All you needed was a laptop and fast internet service, which is accessible in every cafe around the world. And you can just start coding. Um, and I think that's much more difficult in many of the more infrastructure heavy uh, businesses. But what was really fascinating, that thing that I learned was Again, I never wanted to build a beverage business. It sort of happened um, organically as we found demand and we found interest in it. Um, but you know, if you were to ask me before I did this, I would have thought building a improving the value proposition of a beverage business would be so hard. Like, where do you even begin? How do you make a beverage? It sounds like there's a lot of money involved. It's not like I can just open up my laptop and code. But it actually turns out there's a lot of these infrastructure that allows even a beverage entrepreneur to get going almost as easily as a software. There are co-packers out there that would make this for you. You don't need the production costs if you have Indiegogo to pre-order and sort of crowdfund your way out there. Um, you know, and then the, the sort of the other element is to get your uh, idea out there. There's things like product hunt, website, Facebook. Uh, and so it was definitely fascinating. You know, along the way, I've learned a lot and realized without those infrastructure, if I had to do it all by myself, um, more than likely, I, w I would not have done this. Right, I, I, it would have been very difficult for me to establish the demand and certain level of um, calculated risk that I felt good jumping all, all board. Now, did you have any companies that you looked to for inspiration, other companies either in the beverage space or in other product spaces that had used some of these tools that you were able to sort of, instead of reinventing the wheel on your entrepreneurial journey, you were able to sort of kind of steal some of their hacks? Um, I think for hacks, it came more into individual connections. Um, okay. you know, there's a lot of folks. I come from Silicon Valley, so 
um, people working on. I like your term, 10% entrepreneurship. Uh, I mean, it happens all the time in Silicon Valley. They don't really call it entrepreneurship because it's a side project to them, but a lot of the times those side projects becomes a company, which is, you know, in the case of 82 Labs. And so I definitely heard a lot of different hacks on, um, you know, getting the results that you need without having to do all the work. And I think that is just a fundamental mindset of don't reinvent the wheels, uh, really focus on results and, and sort of maximize the throughput. Um, you know, there's a really interesting poster at Facebook that I actually just took and now it's in our office, which is um, motion does not equal progress. Um, and the idea here is you can work hard all you want, but at the end of the day, all you need is progress. And, you know, when you can work efficiently and get things done very quickly and cheaply, always take that option. And so Fiverr, I learned it from other people, actually people at Facebook who are doing similar things. Um, and there's a lot of other tools and product hunt. I, I haven't sort of been recommended it from people, but I'm a big user of it. It was always great to see new ideas. And so I always wanted to announce new products that we work on up there. And I think just the philosophy of building products that even big companies like Facebook, which was, um, you know, Facebook obviously has a lot of data, so the way they make decisions uh, has less risks than, you know, some of the other companies that might not have all those data. But ultimately, we want to invest that the product we make at Facebook is successful before we devote our energy into it. It's never an idea of, we have this great idea, let's go build it. it it's kind of like every idea that we, are, we decide to build already comes with enough proxy data to suggest that the demand is there. Otherwise, we would never build it. Um, and so it always means, how do, you, how, do you, like, how do you prove to me that what you're suggesting is valuable without building that thing? Uh, and it's actually a much easier question than people think. First of all, you can go talk to people. You can just ask them. Uh, do they majority of them like sort of brighten up and want to use it or do they not want to use it? A lot of the times you can hack the software because if it provides a service, you can actually do it in the back end and just provide the service for them with a simple website without the website and the product actually functioning as it's intended. And so these are all things that you know we've done at Facebook, which was... All right, you have this idea. What is its core value proposition and what is the easiest way to prove it and get data before you come to me and ask me for resources like different engineers, different designers. Um, and so I think that mindset was very same with me here, which was I could have said product really matters and I need to build the most tasting, uh, perfect distribution, um, perfect branding, beverage and sell it. But I think that would have taken me seven months. And at that point, basically, I'm going blindfolded and assuming that great product is going to sell. But um, I, I don't believe that. I, I think you need to do it incrementally and really understand that what you're building um, is something of real value to customers. And that starts by getting it in front of getting your ideas out there early. Yeah, the old build it and they will come mindset, which is the field, I guess the field of dreams par paradigm um, is, is I, th I always think about it. I see this a lot of times with entrepreneurs. They build a product thinking that if they build a great product, somehow the, the market will show up. And more times than not, that's not the case. And then they end up pivoting and trying to figure out how to monetize. And they've got this beautifully built product that nobody wants. And so you did quite the opposite. I mean, it reminds me a little of um, one of my books that I sort of could change the way I think, which is The Lean Startup, which is like, how do you quickly and cheaply test things out in order to validate the decisions you're making? And so you did that. You did that. You, you built something that people wanted. And then how did you come to the point where you decided to go full time? What was the tipping point for you to say, okay, I'm going to go, this is it, no more 10%. I'm going to do 100% entrepreneur. Yeah, for me, the predicting demand and testing is, again, it's, it's in a spectrum. The way I think about it is, if people love your samples and they request it, they give you good feedback, that's a sign of demand, but it doesn't translate to sales. You don't know if they'll actually buy it. There's a lot of things that you can give to people for free and they'll take it. Uh, but if you put a price tag on it, they might not take it. And so, you know, it took us a lot of different uh, iteration of testing until Indiegogo, and Indiegogo was the ultimate test, which was, here it is now, buy it <laughs> and so when indiegogo did really well that was uh, one of the primary milestones uh, that gave us conviction that we had something really valuable that we wanted to build on top of and our goal for indiegogo was actually twenty-five thousand dollars, which was the minimum order quantity 
that was required to get the production going. It was actually over twenty five thousand, but I was convinced that if I could raise twenty five thousand from pre orders, I'll chip in the rest of the money, which was around fifteen thousand dollars. Maybe I'll get friends and family to chip in and invest. Um, and in three weeks, we made two fifty thousand dollars in Indiegogo, uh, and so I think that was sort of oh, people people really value this. And then. Um, about 50, 40 to 50 percent of the people that we gave samples to by email when we match it against Indiegogo actually came back and bought it, um, which is our sign of retention. And and that wasn't perfect either because I don't I don't have every single sample recipients out there you know that talk to talk to us back, and they might use different emails on Indiegogo. Maybe they all got they got their spouse or friends to buy it, but just directly matching email, 40 to 50 percent bought it, which means one out of two sample recipients who tried it actually came back and bought it. And so along with $2,000 and our retention data, um, I was pretty convinced that this is a very valuable product that the $5 price tag, which we launched in Indiegogo, four to $5, you know, depending on the volume package. Um, I thought it was a uh, enough value proposition for us to um, really go full time. And then the other thing was, it wasn't a big decision. Um, I think everything that I try to do, I try to delay the decision until I absolutely have to. And so in the case of working at Tesla and this, if this conflicted with my job at Tesla or vice versa, yes, I have to make that decision, but I was able to sort of start with 10% of my time. And then at some point, like it became 60% of my time. So that but then it became obvious that, okay, now um, if I keep doing this, I will probably get fired at Tesla um, because the work demand is too high for me to sustain at sort of high level of um, output. and. If I need to scale back on my time at Tesla, I can't put enough time and effort into my business. And so it just became sort of obvious after Indiegogo with me spending so much time here that um, we had to do this full time. And so you went full time and now this business is off and running. Uh, what would be your advice to other entrepreneurs, maybe who are just dreaming of doing something, haven't even started a ten percent, or maybe somebody who's in a ten percent? And you know, this, this is a show about trying to choose to do the things you actually want to do and leave everything else to the side. So, what would be your advice to other aspiring entrepreneurs? Um, that's a, that's a tough one. You know, I'm 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 still learning, and so I'm not sure what advice is useful. But um, for me, um, what's important to me is sort of removing your self bias uh, on solving the problem that you want to solve and really figuring out what the world needs and what the world needs, is willing to pay for. And so there's this really interesting, um, I think it was a blog post by Andreessen and Horowitz where they look at the success of a VC backed companies and they look at three variables, um, great team, great product, great market. And I think their output is, uh, their outcome was great market trumps all of them. Uh, and I think it's very true. I, I think, there are entrepreneurs that are just so passionate about what they do and they want to they sort of build a business around it. And I think that's very inspiring. And I think if that's what you love to do um, and maximizing profit and building a business empire isn't your goal, um, you should absolutely do it. If you love what you do, go make it happen. But for other people that are looking for opportunities to build a business around and looking for ideas, uh, I think it's just really, really important that you don't get caught up on what you think is a good idea, but rather... Um, really understand what does the market need, what are the problems that people are willing to pay for and spend their time acquiring that product. Because I think once you have that pool, uh, your life just becomes so much easier. You know, there's a difference of building a product that people don't want at this moment and then convincing them to buy versus just solving their pain problem. Uh, I think people want to solve problems <laughs> and they will pay for it. I, I think you're right. And, and I can tell you that this category is something that's still open. Nobody solved this problem. Um, so I look forward to being one of your customers. I plan on going out tonight to celebrate um, all the taping I did today for this show. And I don't have morning recovery in my refrigerator, but I will sorely be wishing I had it probably tomorrow morning. Um, uh, Sisan, I, I really want to thank you for being here. And I want to ask you to tell um, our listeners where they can learn more about you and your, your story and also learn more about um, your company and your products. Yeah, so our company and product, its best location is our website. So that's morningrecoverydrink.com. And um, I, not, not really much on myself, but we've, we've been blogging about our journey. And so um, if you... If you type morning recovery, a lot of the press articles, um, a lot of it is just um, direct quotes from us sharing our story. We have a 
a medium page where we blogged about um, how we made a million dollar in three months and how our community helped us build our brand from an idea into a 33 million valuation company in one year. Uh, and so that was us just like sharing our journey. And a lot of it is what we talked about today. Yeah, and, and I encourage you, everybody, to check out the website. Um, the the story we we got into a lot of it today, but it really is um, these these stories are. It seems impossible to look back at it. You know, you, you obviously come from a, a really strong background. Technically, you've worked at great companies, but the things that you're done, uh, many of those things are things that a lot of other people could do as they seek to build a business. And maybe they won't build a business that's valued over thirty million dollars in just a year. But I can tell you that if you follow some of these steps, you can certainly build a business that could have a lot of potential. Um, so with that, um, I, I want to encourage everybody to check out my website, patrickbeginnis.com, where you can find a lot more about FOMO Sapiens, find out how to become a 10% entrepreneur, which um, if you are inspired by CSUN's story, um, could be the right path for you to start your entrepreneurial journey. And keep on checking out FOMO Sapiens. You can find us all over the place, including on iTunes, where if you are so inspired, I'd love to have you subscribe give me five stars and leave a rating. And so um, I hope this conversation has inspired you to consider entrepreneurship in your life, starting part-time. And until next time, give it a try and take care of yourself. Thanks.